what I want to do is talk about some very interesting developments that have been taking place in Egypt over the last 20, 30 years. But to do that, I want to go into it somewhat from my own perspective, because my own story overlaps on these developments to some extent, as you'll see. And to begin with, what I want to do is, is go back to the beginning. Like a lot of people, in fact, a lot of people in this organization, I got my start. Uh, the whole mystical aspect of Egypt first came to me when I was reading Edgar Cayce as a teenager. And Edgar Cayce talked about a lot of different things, but there were two things in particular that are going to relate to tonight. One of those is his notion of lost civilizations and Atlantis. And another one is his claim that there is a chamber beneath one of the paws of the Sphinx that contains the Hall of Records. He felt there was another chamber maybe in the Yucatan. But he felt there might be some very important knowledge in the Hall of Records that pertains to humanity's lost history and maybe some higher wisdom of some sort, either on papyrus or perhaps carved into stone in some fashion. And from there, I wound up getting into a number of different mainstream scholars on Egypt, like IES Edwards, Rundle Clark, and um, Wallace Budge. But it's when I discovered this book, Serpent in the Sky, back in the 80s. That was a turning point for me. And what basically John Anthony West, the author, was saying in this book was that there's a whole dimension to Egypt that we don't understand from our literalistic sort of mindset, that if you understand Egypt in terms of the symbolism and the inferences beneath the hieroglyphics and beneath the furniture and beneath everything, the monuments and the statues, there's a level of meaning that isn't obvious on the surface. And this is a theory that was really uh, promoted. That's John Anthony West. But the theory really goes back to Schwaller de Lubitsch, who was a scholar. Uh, he died in 1961 in Grassy, France, curiously enough. And he talked about this idea in his books, like the Temple of Man being perhaps his masterpiece, this idea that Egypt has, within its geometry, within its mathematics, within everything having to do with Egyptian civilization, this, this dimension of spiritual depth and wisdom that isn't apparent on the surface. And what John did was, with his book, he basically was trying to popularize this idea. He made it accessible. Schwaller is not easy to read. Has anybody here read anything by Schwaller de Lubitsch by any chance? I tried. Tried? <laughs> yes. A lot of people try. It's very tough. And even John acknowledged that Schwaller was not a good writer. He had no sense of metaphor. He did not really have much of a literary sense, but he had profundity and wisdom but you just have to really work at it to chisel away those ideas. And that's what John was trying to do with, with Serpent in the Sky. And I went in the late 80s, exactly 40 years ago, I, I stayed at a Zen monastery in upstate New York, a Zen Mountain Monastery. And during my last week there, I, I read in the local paper that John was going to be giving a talk at the local library in Woodstock. And so the night before I left the monastery to come back to Chicago, I wound up going to hear him talk at the library. And he basically spoke about this idea of the symbolist interpretation of Egypt and the spiritual dimensions of Egypt. And he mentioned in passing something that Schwaller said in his book. He hinted very briefly in his book, uh, Schwaller's writing, I think, The Temple of Man, that the Sphinx is much older than it seems to the way most scholars look at the Sphinx. And that's due to weather patterns, weathering patterns on the side of the Sphinx. And John decided to run with that. And he said, if that's true, that the Sphinx is indeed older. Well, actually, before, let me back up a little bit. I went up to John after the lecture. And I said to him, so do you think maybe the Sphinx dates back to the age of Leo, which is about 12,000 years ago? Because I had heard that theory before. What John was introducing that was unique and what Schwaller introduced was that there might be geological evidence to back that up, which is a different sort of thing. And John responded saying, it could be, but it could be the previous age of Leo. It could be 36,000 years ago. We don't know. So anyway. John decided to 
see if he could enlist the help of a geologist, a formal geologist that might be able to help him prove this once and for all, one way or the other. So he got in touch with a fellow named Robert Schock, that's Robert, who was a, uh, I think he had just gotten his tenure at Boston University, and he talked to uh, Robert about this, and Robert says, that actually should be something we can prove because he was such a good geologist that he could look at the weathering patterns and they're trained to look at the different patterns in terms of what they mean as to in terms of whether it's wind weathering or water weathering. And the reason that's so significant, the water weathering, is there has not been any heavy rainfall in Egypt for the last 10,000 years, which means if it is indeed water weathering and not wind weathering, the Sphinx has to be at least 10,000 years old. Now there's different theories, we'll get into that in a little bit here, but um, so he got in touch with Robert Schock, and they went to Egypt, and they wound up studying the, the Sphinx enclosure very carefully. And mind you, I wound up coming here in 1989 after I had left the monastery and I had a, uh, went to live in Tucson for a while, and then I came here. And I started working at the Theosophical Society in 89, and I worked here for 10 years. And my job was basically acquisitions for the magazine and for the book division. So I thought I'd get back in touch with John and uh, to see if he would write something for us in the magazine. And so for the winter 91 issue, I, I had him write an article that turned out really well and I did an interview along with him to run with the article. And it actually went over very well. It wound up getting reprinted in Science of Mind. I mean, the whole article in the interview got reprinted in various places like Science of Mind magazine. And in the interview, John made two points, basically, essentially. One was he emphasized the spiritual teaching, the spiritual message to us of the Egyptian civilization, that here was an entire civilization founded upon spiritual principles. And it ran through everything they did, and this civilization lasted for thousands of years. And he felt that that was really a great message for us, you know, the possibility of that sort of spiritual society. The other point that he raised was the research he was doing with Robert Schock. And it kind of broke, the Quest magazine really broke the story, the idea that they went to Egypt, they did ground penetrating radar studies on the surface around the Sphinx with a fellow named Thomas Dobecki, who was a, a sonic engineer, a expert in uh, that sort of thing. And along with Boris Said, who would take the sledgehammer, more on Boris in a minute, he would take the sledgehammer and pound the ground and that's how they would get the sonic soundings of what's underneath. And so they found, well the one thing was, uh, Robert Schock wound up saying that indeed he felt that the Sphinx had water weathering patterns and the enclosure showed water weathering. You see the difference is with wind weathering, it's basically, I think, I hope I'm right about this, it's horizontal erosion patterns. Whereas with water weathering, it's the water runs down over the sides and creates these vertical grooves like you see here. You have a bit of both obviously, but those uh, vertical lines are mainly water weathering. And uh, so we printed that in the magazine. It caused a little bit of a fuss. It, it really went over well with the Quest Theosophical audience. But it uh, started to get uh, more traction outside, especially when it wound up going in Science of Mind and a few other places. And then John's a tours actually got more attention. They made the cover of the, the front page of the New York Times at one point. And, uh, Robert published his research in a uh, geological, uh, formal academic research in a geological uh, publication. And that caused uh, uh, ripples in the geological community. And then that caused more ripples to the scientific community in general because of the fact that he was claiming there was hard scientific evidence for civilization having started much earlier because to build a sphinx like this, to create a monument of this sort, implied there was an organized society way earlier than we previously thought in places like Sumeria and, you know, elsewhere. So the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, this, this started to cause such a fuss, what, what Schock and uh, West were saying, 
that the AAAS decided we got <laughs> we got to put a stop to this. That was they didn't say that, but that's obviously. I think that they didn't like these noisy upstarts from the fringe causing problems for the the established timeline of civilization. The the AAAS it's like a breakout of many different meetings and conferences, or many different meetings and lectures at a given conference. And Schock was set to debate Mark Lehner, who is a well-known um, Egyptologist, one of the two or three most well-known Egyptologists out there. And they were going to have this debate to kind of settle the matter along with a couple other people. And so I went down there with, uh, I enlisted a, a, a theosophical writer from around here, Rosemary Clark. We went down and we covered the uh, meeting at the conference. Boris Said filmed it. And uh, it was a very interesting thing because both of these two very intelligent men were debating the evidence pro and con. And Mark Lehner's argument essentially boiled down to the fact that there's no hard evidence for a civilization having been around at that early time, 10,000, 12,000 years ago. Shock didn't go back as far as West. West went way back, said it was over 10,000 years old. Shock was more conservative and basically took a stance that it was only maybe five, six thousand years older. And um, nothing was firmly settled by it. It caused a big fuss, though. It became headlines around the world, this particular debate between Shock and um, Lehner. And afterwards, Rosemary Clark held a party for West and Said and Shock over in Phillip Park here. And, a lot of us went to that, and that's the first chance I had to talk to Robert Schock. I told him I was with the magazine. He says, oh yeah, you know, before you published that article with John West, I was going to submit something about the research that John and I had been doing. And I said, how did you know about the magazine? And he said, oh, my grandmother was a theosophist, so I knew, I knew what the organization did and, you know, what it was up to. So then, I was one of the input people for acquisitions for the book division. I talked to John. It, the book had gone out of print. So I talked to John whether he would want to see a reprint of the book, and he was open to that, of course. So then we, uh, uh, the, the board here uh, signed off on a reprint of Serpent in the Sky, which was scheduled to come up in uh, 1993. And he did an updated version with an appendix about the updated uh, research he was doing with Shock. Now, in the meantime, West and Shock and Boris Said were putting together a TV show for NBC with state-of-the-art for 1993, state-of-the-art graphics, basically explaining this idea of the older Sphinx called Mystery of the Sphinx. How many people here have seen that particular show? Only one. I'm very surprised. It was, it was a big thing at the time. We thought it was going to basically bomb because it was up against the uh, network premiere of Dances with Wolves. And the show was going to be on. It was NBC. The host was none other than Charlton Heston. And lo and behold, it, it smashed Dances with Wolves in the radiance, which showed there's a real interest in this subject of, of Egyptology and ancient civilizations and all that. And that just caused even greater ripples in the scientific community. And it became a debate in the next 10, 15 years in Egyptological journals like Kemet. And to me, the highlight of the show, it wasn't the one that I think a lot of people focused on so much. But these are pictures I took in Egypt and, uh, in 97. And if you look to the top, you see there are three layers of restoration bricks on the Sphinx. In other words, it was so severely eroded over thousands of years that the Egyptians had to support it with these um, bricks that kind of like covered up the erosion. There's three layers of these erosion, uh, these, these supporting bricks. At the top, you see the oldest. Then you have these here, which are next oldest. And then you have these you know, relatively brand new ones here. Okay. Now, the question is, there were bricks put in place to support it to kind of stave off the erosion shortly after the Sphinx was built, according to mainstream timelines. Now, how did that much erosion take place in just a couple hundred years? I forget the exact figure. It doesn't add up, and that's one of the points they made in the TV show. You know, it's, it's in the years since 
that point when the Sphinx was supposedly built, the, there's been relatively little erosion compared to that supposedly small time frame when all this major erosion occurred that required the, the uh, bricks. Now, so anyway, then the next year in 1994, I had the chance to go to Egypt with John. He's led countless trips to Egypt, and they're very unique the way he does it. He talks about this spiritual symbolist dimension of it, but the thing that he did that was so unique that I, I'm unaware of anyone else doing this with trips to Egypt was he would let you wander around the temple, the sites, uh, for a solid hour before saying a word. In other words, he wouldn't lecture and precondition your mind. He would let you first soak in the ambience of these places. So you would go to the Temple of Dendera, for example, in silence and walk around and take it in, which is an awesome experience. And then he would talk about it. So it's, it's I think, a great way to do it. This is, uh, that's a shot I took at Kalm Ambu, which is a very interesting oracular temple off the Nile, John leading the trip. And that's a picture I took, actually, in that same, I believe it was the same temple. It's, uh, the sun was coming in from the side. It was an amazing thing. Sometimes the lighting in these temples would be extraordinary. Now, but the highlight of the trip was he takes people, he would take people, I don't know if they still let people go, private groups into the uh, king's chamber of the pyramid, the Great Pyramid. But he took us as a group at the end of the trip into the Great Pyramid. Uh, which is really an amazing experience. Has anybody been inside the Great Pyramid? Three people, okay. Was it, was it a great experience for you? Or? We went at night. You went at night, yeah, we went at night too. Yeah. Right, and when did you go, at night or day? Or? During the day. Okay, were you with a group or no? A group. Okay, yeah. And fortunately, John had the group somewhat subdued because sometimes you walk in, I've been in the pyramid other times, and you have chattering tourists and cameras going off and all that, it totally ruins the ambience. But with John's group, everybody was dead silent going in, which gives you a, a ceremonial feel to it. And then we went up into the king's chamber. That, this is through the grand gallery leading up into the king's chamber, which you have to duck down to get into it. It's an extraordinary uh, monument, the, the pyramid. Just, it's an amazing thing, 5,000 years old. And then we went into the king's chamber. That's not my picture. Um, and John had us around the room, you know, sitting along the side. And then everybody, it's kind of obligatory to do some chanting while you're in the king's chamber. And two interesting things. I did not have a, a great mystical experience inside the King's Chamber like some people. You hear these sorts of things uh, through the ages about people going in and, you know, even there's legends about Napoleon going in and all that and you know, seeing things, coming out pale. You don't know whether these stories are true or not. But I did have two interesting things happen. One was, you know, I, I, people took turns climbing into the sarcophagus, which is empty, and I don't believe for a second that it was an actual tomb. I think it was a ceremonial, you know, site, the, uh, the pyramid itself, and the sarcophagus is basically, I think, a ceremonial, you know, artifice. And so I got in like everybody else did, not at the same time, but I got into the sarcophagus, and I started chanting. And I'm finding different pitches. And I hit a certain pitch, and suddenly it felt like the whole room started uh, resonating. It was an uncanny sensation. I, I, I don't know what note it was. It might have been B flat. I forget what the Hertog, James Hertog, said what it was. And like, and then boo, the, the sarcophagus vibrated like a bell, and it was extraordinary. And I thought I must have discovered something important. But I discovered when I got back to Illinois that a lot of people knew about this, including the Grateful Dead, when they were in the, they were in Egypt back in the 70s, and they were playing with that same sound. So that was well known, but I had never heard of it before. The other thing that was was a little more personal for me, was as I was sitting along the edge of the chamber. My mind was very scattered because I was so excited to be inside. I'd been looking forward for years to going inside the king's chamber. And there I was, and my mind was going in a million directions. And finally, I, after about an hour of trying to meditate, I was doing some alternate breathing techniques, which is a good way to kind of settle the mind down. And finally, I started to feel like I was relaxing. And I started to feel at that point like there was a big ball of energy above my head. 
And I've meditated before. I'm not a fantastic meditator, but I can meditate okay, and I've never had that happen like that. And then when I came out of the uh, pyramid that night, it dawned on me that the, what I experienced was almost exactly what those ancient Egyptian engravings show, and the same size, too. You know, that, that to me was quite a revelation. I still don't know. I, I have some thoughts about what that might mean. But, you know, that's the only time in my life I've had anything. It was that palpable. It was like I could almost reach up and feel it like a beach ball of, of light or energy above my head. And, of course, you know, if you're into the yoga th tradition, you know about the thousand-petaled lotus and the crown chakra and all that. But, again, I've never had that specific experience before. Now... Now, uh, Boris Said, I kept in touch with John. I still keep in touch with John. But uh, after the experience at the AAAS conference, I started to communicate with Boris Said, who was the filmmaker that was filming the conference at the AAAS uh, meeting. And he also... Um, was he was basically the producer of the mystery of the Sphinx show. And he had known John since childhood. And Boris Said was very much of an Ernest Hemingway kind of character, a big barrel-chested guy, fearless. You know, he had been in two Olympics uh, running a bobsled team, and he had been racing cars when he was younger and had done all kinds of crazy thing, which I, things which I won't mention here. And so a very fearless, very bold character, a Taurus, and I, I got to talking to him quite a bit over the phone um, after the conference. And we, we kept in touch, and he told me, this was around 1996, that he had gone to the Giza Plateau and had climbed down. He had had a falling out with John in the meantime, by the way, which I won't get into. So they didn't talk again after the, um, the TV show. But uh, he was continuing, both of them continued to do their research in Egypt. And Boris went over there in 96, and he spoke about a well shaft that was very mysterious that existed somewhere between the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid. And he had climbed down the ladder, and, and it was covered with water. There was three layers. We'll talk about this more in just a second. But there are three stages to this shaft that goes down underground. And he said there was a mysterious chamber at the very bottom that was somewhat filled with water, and he got into it, and he, he said that James Hertog, who was an interesting writer, anybody here know the name James Hertog, J.J. Hertog? He, uh, he became well-known a long time ago in the mystical community, the esoteric community, mainly for uh, a book he wrote called Forbidden Knowledge, Keys of Enoch, which without any publicity sold 100,000 copies which is no small feat. And uh, he was a scientist who had had mystical experiences and became a teacher and a lecturer, still goes around teaching with his wife, Desiree. And Boris and J.J. Hertog uh, wanted to put together an expedition to explore this chamber down at the bottom. It was mainly Hertog's idea. Hertog is a, 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 a very interesting, very intelligent character. And he felt that there was something important in this chamber at the bottom of the well shaft. So they enlisted the help of the ARE, the Edgar Cayce organization. That's her talk and, and Boris down on the shaft. They got the ARE interested. And so Joe Shore bankrolled the expedition. But it was set to go in February of 1997. And... Boris invited me to come with if I wanted to in a journalistic capacity, so I wasn't going to pass that up. And so, skipping ahead here a little bit, uh, in February of 1997, I, I flew over there and met up with Boris in Hertog. And the first night we were there, which was, I don't know if it was February 16th, but it was the night that uh, Uranus conjuncted Jupiter and Aquarius, if any of you are astrologers. It's an, an extraordinary alignment. It was actually a stellium in Aquarius, tropical Sidereus, I mean tropical uh, zodiac. And the first night, we all met up at the, at the Great Pyramid, and we 
converged into the king's chamber and her talk basically conducted a three hour talking ceremony to kind of inaugurate this expedition on a positive note. And so the next day it all started in earnest where everybody got together on the plateau. This is, uh, this is where it was. Now that's one of the three pyramids in the background. You see right down there is the entrance down to the well shaft. And for years, the water table had risen so high that you couldn't go down to the bottom layer. But in 96 and 97, the water table was going down, which allowed people to investigate it. And the ARE got permission because they were old friends with Boris, uh, with Zahi Huas. They got permission to go down and investigate this. Just a filming permit. Not an, not an archaeological digging permit. More on that later. And so... The next morning, they all kind of met up. We all met up on the plateau there, and some of the crew, the film crew, went down with their film equipment into that chamber. Now, this is a drawing that was done after the fact. This was, I think, on the uh, mystery of the Sphinx, Joe. You see, up here is the entrance. It goes down, and there's like the first layer. It's filled with debris. Uh, that's another way to look at it. That's when you go into it. And that's the first layer. It was dirty. It wasn't very nice. And then the next layer down is, uh, it's, it's, it's a burial spot because you have, I think it's seven. This only shows six, but there's actually seven niches and two sarcophagus. Sarcophagi, I think, is the proper way to say it. And at the bottom is that, about 100 feet down. Now, so anyway, uh, it was several days. I didn't go down for about two days because I didn't want to get in the way of the camera crew. But it was, I think, on February 18th of that year that the cameraman, the cinematographer, his name was Garrett. I don't remember his last name. He was adjusting the tripod for the movie camera. And he noticed that there was a slab of, of stone underneath the, the dirt. And that raised everybody's curiosity. What is that? And so word started percolating up to the top, you know, what is going, what is down there? In fact, everybody wondered, the chamber was so decrepit and in such a ruinous state that some people suspected the chamber at the very bottom might just be a natural uh, cavity. It might not even be something man-made, you know, human-made. Uh, but that, that slab, that was not supposed to be there. Nobody had ever said anything about a, a smooth slab. That's the thing that made it look, it didn't look like just a piece of rock sticking up out of the mud. So anyway, I managed to get down there. This is what it goes down that you see right here. It's very steep. This was here so that Joe Shore did not want to climb the ladder because it was very rickety and it was pretty scary. And uh, Joe Shore had to be lowered down. I don't blame him, but frankly, I thought that was scarier than going down the ladder. So this is going down. I can't remember if that's from the second or the third layer or what, but then you get down to that second level. That's her talk on the right. That's Garrett, the cameraman, on the left. And you have these niches. Like you see here, there were seven of those, uh, three on each side and then one on the end. That's the ladder there, you see. And this sarcophagus there is made out of, I thought it was basalt, but I just looked it up and it said that it was granite. But you have these sarcophagi in Egypt. They're like 25 tons and the sides are as smooth as can be. You wonder how did they carve these things and how did they get them down the shaft? It is not a big shaft. How do you get a 25 ton sarcophagus down a narrow shaft, you know, 3,000 years ago or whenever it happened? And that's a close-up of the, that particular sarcophagus. But there's another, there's one other sarcophagus on that layer that is even more mysterious, which I did not, I regret it to this day, I did not take a picture of it. Uh, this is a picture somebody else took. It's very different. It looked so shabby and ruinous that I didn't bother photographing it. And we're going to come back to this in a little bit because this is really, really interesting. Now, so then I climbed down the ladder, got all the way to the bottom, and there's this cavity, this large chamber, whatever you call it, and you have these things sticking up that later turned out to be uh, the, the remains of pillars, 
There were supposedly four pillars. That's looking one direction. In other words, you come down and to the far right, you get off the ladder, and to the far right, that's looking this way, and there's like a, up in the corner there, there was a hole that people thought might lead to some other chamber. And then to the left, you had this other kind of pillar. And in the middle, you had this water. And along the outer rim, you had this water. And it was very dank and dusty, and, and it was hard to breathe down there. There was no ventilation. And um, the water, you could see, I, I saw anyway, some human bones sticking up out of the water. It just had a very spooky feel to it. And I remembered those old things, those old sayings about you know, curses on, you know, you, you step into touch tomb and, you know, you, so I asked Rosemary to give me some, you know, Egyptian mantra to kind of offset, you know, doesn't hurt. Anyway, so in the middle of the room, see now this is, that's Desiree Hurtak, that's Carol Pate, a psychic that they brought with, that Joe Shore brought with from St. Louis, I guess. That was a gal from the film crew. That's Boris standing by the ladder there. And this is the film equipment. And right around here, you see, is where the slab started, where the cameraman noticed this slab. Now, I, when I went down, I took this picture, which has made its way around the internet a few million times, because Boris gave it to Art Bell, and next thing you know, I saw it all over the place. This is what, or I need to explain this a little bit. We had an Egyptian observer watching us the whole time because they didn't want any hanky-panky. They didn't want us taking a sledgehammer and knocking a hole in the wall or something like that. But one day when we were down there, I was there with Boris and uh, James Hurtock and a, a couple of the cameramen. And the observer went up the ladder to take a bathroom break for a few minutes. So we, we all looked at each other and we scrambled onto the ground and we clawed away the dirt with our fingers to reveal what you see here. Now, we weren't supposed to do that, but we were very careful not to ruin anything. Anyway, so you can see there, it, it, now it's still, you still can't quite tell, is it man-made or is it, is it natural? It, we just couldn't tell. But when word got back to the Egyptians, that kind of like, the, the whole mood shifted in terms of how the officials were observing us. And you know, they, they were excited at the same time that they were kind of panicking because they, they didn't want us like doing anything more than we had already done. And I can understand that, but there were other reasons too, which I'll get to in a minute. And so we were more or less stalled from doing anything else down there. We really wanted to just keep clawing away and see what was underneath that. Thomas Dobecki, he's the sonic engineer that worked with the Mystery of the Sphinx show. He went down there with his GPS device, you know, where you, you can send sound waves through and see what's on the other side of the, the, the foundation. And what he did was he took his sonic devices over the entire room, but he took the GPS, the ground penetrating radar, I guess that's the particular device he used in that case. There's several different you know, remote sensing devices and that I think is the one. What he picked up on his devices was there was a hollow underneath. And he seemed to feel that that hollow led downwards a ways. And so then, of course, that just piqued everybody's curiosity. Is this, was it a sarcophagus or was it a tunnel? Because to be honest, what a lot of people were interested in finding out, you know, what, what, Boris, uh, what Boris and a few of the others were really interested in is could we find the Hall of Records? And was, uh, was this a room that somehow led to the Hall of Records or some other chamber? Because there have been all these rumors over the years about chambers underneath the Giza Plateau and underneath the Sphinx and all this. And, and you know, uh, John West and Schock had found a, a, a indications of a chamber beneath the paw right where Casey said there might be. Now that's been debated to this day. But so Boris was excited to see if this might lead somewhere, and, and Thomas Dobecki felt that hollow might lead to something. You know, we didn't know, and we weren't able to find out. But um, that's another view taken from the ladder that I was looking down. Now, I, I do want to mention, in the one corner, there was this hole. And so we were trying to figure out did that hole maybe lead to another spot, 
that's still undecided. You know, they, they sent a remote little robot camera up there after we left, and they said it only went about 16 feet, although, again, these, everything is debated, you know, about what do you believe, what do you not believe. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, I don't have, you know, evidence one way or the other. But, um, and by the way, there is, is there some tunnel leading out of this chamber that's important? There may be. One thing that's, that's curious about this room is that the water in the room, if you looked at the water up closely, the part that wasn't uh, muddy, it was crystal clear, and I've even heard it said that you could even drink it. Now, I don't know if that's true, but the water had to be coming in from somewhere. Now, where did that water come in? And if indeed it was a channel cut in from the Nile, that logistically is an extraordinary uh, feat on the part of the Egyptians. This is 100 feet underground. So we did not see evidence of a chamber. And you know, I'm, I'm kind of giving you a tease here because there's so much more I could say about this. But there could indeed be some evidence of a tunnel leading out of this room if it isn't underneath the, the, uh, the sarcophagus. So we had to kill time the next few, the next week or so, because they wouldn't let us do any more, you know, digging in the uh, king's chamber. I mean, in the, uh, the the tomb of Osiris, as it's now called. And so they were doing uh, Dobeki over there. You see him on the far right with her talk, Dobeki, and that's uh, Dobeki's son. And this is Joe Jehoda from the Edgar Casey group. That's Boris Said, and that's Joe Shore. Um, they, did a, they had other fish to fry on the, the plateau, and so they were doing sonic GPS all over the plateau, actually, to see if there was indeed evidence of a tunnel leading from that chamber to one of the pyramids. And now this is, Zahi Awas came along one day, and they, for the TV show that never got produced, never got shown, I should say, um, they wanted to film interviewing Zahi Awas between the paws of the Sphinx. I'm sure you've heard of Zahi Awas. He was the major figure in Egypt for years. He was always on TV. Whenever they would feature a special about Egypt, you'd see Zahi Awas front and center. And that's him in the middle. And that's Joe Shore and that's Joe Jehoda. And they were getting setting up for the, uh, for the uh, TV thing. And I happened to speak to Joe Jehoda about Zahi after this was over. And he said that uh, he spoke very fondly of Zahi. He, Zahi has as many enemies as he has friends. And Joe Jehoda and Joe Shore knew Zahi since they basically put him through college. You know, the ARE, the Edgar Casey group, put uh, Zahi Awas through school, basically. And Joe Jehoda said, he spoke very fondly of Zahi by saying that when he came over to America, I think it was Penn, Penn State, I'm not sure about that. When he came over to America, he could barely speak English. And Jehoda said how hard it was for Zahi to, to get his degree like that. You know, he spoke very highly of the effort it took to get his degree. But anyway, then one day, Mark Lehner, as you may remember from the AAAS conference, happened to wander by when we were standing around the opening to the shaft. And he was kind of teasing the group, saying, so did you find the Hall of Records down there? And it was good natured, but you know, he had, you see, I spoke to Joe Jehotam about him too, and he had said that Mark Lehner had gone down into the chamber back in the 70s, when it was more filled with water, and he felt that that chamber at the bottom of the shaft must be very significant because it was so close to the pyramids. Okay, because you have the burials or the, the ceremonial sites that are close to the pyramid take on greater importance because the pyramids have such great importance in that uh, you know, legacy. Now, I'm fast forwarding here a little bit. You see, in the academic journals, Lehner wound up continuing to more or less criticize Shock and West for trying to promote this lost civilization hypothesis. And I thought went a little too far with it. It was almost as though he was insinuating that because West in particular 
was promoting the lost civilization idea and the Hall of Records, that he was a new age kind of flake. So, one day I'm in the library downstairs here, the Olcott Library, and I'm looking through the books on Egypt, and I happen to come across this curious little book called The Egyptian Heritage, based on the Edgar Cayce readings. Who's the author? Mark Lehner. So Mark Lehner had had his background, like Zahi Awas, with the Edgar Cayce group, and was promoting the idea of Hall of Records and Lost Civilizations, just like John West. So I took the liberty of writing a letter to the editor of this major Egyptological popular magazine called Kemet, more or less pointing this out, not to embarrass Mark Lehner, but to more or less give some context to his comments because he kept pointing out, being very critical of West and Schock. And in fact, he himself came from the exact same roots that West and Schock and Boris Said and Joe Jehoda and Joe Shore came from. So he toned down the rhetoric quite a bit after that. Anyway, as part of that particular trip in 1997, Boris had to do, again, they were killing time because they couldn't do any more work down in the chamber. So Boris and the film crew went to do some filming up in the King's Chamber up here. That's the Queen's Chamber, that's the King's Chamber. This is the entrance, you come in through this sort of ragged opening, you come up the, the, the grand gallery there into the King's Chamber. And I, we more or less had free reign of the pyramid, so I took the opportunity to climb down into the shaft at the bottom here, the subterranean chamber, which is a very narrow, it's 42 inches square. This is, the pyramid is not a playground for claustrophobics. And this is looking up, it's 200 and some feet climbing down this very narrow pathway. And there's all sorts of theories about this and astronomy and all this, we can't get into that tonight. But it's a pretty rigorous climb down and so I got down to the bottom. There's a picture I took in the bottom. There are better pictures out there, but this is mine, so I decided to use this one. And uh, it's, it looks very rough. And some people think that it's an unfinished burial chamber, but some people like, like Normandy, for example, believe that it had a ceremonial sort of significance, which I think makes much more sense, that it wasn't simply an unfinished chamber. Uh, I don't think the Egyptians were that haphazard. But I had a funny thing, uh, a curious thing happened when I was down there. It's, it's a very spooky feeling to be alone in that very deep spot. It's, as you can see, it's, it's quite deep underground there. You know, that's you know, 200 some feet down and you're down there by yourself. And what I did was, I, I, I had a strange feeling about the acoustics in that room. So what, just on a hunch, I stomped down on the floor several times. And it sounded as though the whole pyramid rang like a gong. And I'd never heard about that before. And so I kept stomping down, which is also a slightly weird feeling because you don't know if everything's gonna come crashing down on you. But it was as though you could hear, it was like the, the pyramid was a bell, like that. And I asked John West about that, who's been down in the, the chamber many times, and he said he wasn't even aware of that. He had never heard of that effect before. Now, fast forward a year. It was about a year later, almost exactly to the year later, that Reuters News featured an article saying Zahi Awas discovers the lost tomb of Osiris. You know, he apparently, after we had left, he got very busy with his team of men, and they went down there and they proceeded to excavate the room as best as they could. And he said, this is the greatest discovery of my life. He gave no credit to Hurtak or Said or the ARE. Um, and he said, maybe this was the lost tomb of Osiris or the, well, actually not, Herodotus, the ancient Greek historian, spoke about burial chambers or a burial chamber deep underground on the Giza Plateau that had a lake around a, a, a burial spot, a sarcophagus. And so then a year after that, in March of 1999, Fox TV had a special called Uncovering the Lost Tomb with Maury Povich hosting it 
and Zahi Awas front and center, more or less talking about his uh, discovery. This is a, a, actually a passage from Herodotus in which he says, I've highlighted it. The underground chambers in the hill, that's the Giza Plateau, where the pyramids stand, these the king meant to be burial places for himself and surrounded them with water, bringing in a channel from the Nile. And Zahi Awas felt this could indeed be the, uh, the spot that Herodotus spoke about, which is what a lot of people thought when we were there in 97. They thought it actually fit the uh, description, the water. So the Fox TV show more or less featured Zahi Awas um, uh, showing off his discovery. And what he did was they finally excavated that slab that we saw. And that's what it looked like when they, they hoisted it up. And they, I don't think they've been able to empty all the, pump all the water out of the chamber yet. And that's him in front of a little another shot of it there. And you can see down below the bottom of that sarcophagus, or whatever it is. Now this is an artist recreation of what it might have looked like in its heyday. Four pillars around the sarcophagus that's underwater, or at least partly submerged, we don't know. And the theory is that you know those ruinous things that I saw on uh, sticking up out of the ground were originally pillars up to the ceiling with maybe hieroglyphics, possibly. Now, so quite a bit of time passed, and I didn't hear anything more about the the tomb of Osiris until I came across, I heard about this book by Robert Temple who was gained some fame back in the 70s for a book called The Serious Mystery, a controversial book about Egypt and the Dogon tribe and all this. And he wrote this book, he's written a number of books, but he wrote this book that devoted a chapter to the, the tomb of Osiris. And I learned quite a few new things about it that were really very interesting. And um, one of those things was, if you remember that sarcophagus on the second layer that is the grayish sort of rock, now you can't date stone in the, through uh, carbon dating because carbon dating only works for things that had been alive. It doesn't work for stone. However, there's a new method that has been discovered called thermoluminescence, which is you can tell when a, a, a piece of stone or a slab was last exposed to sunlight. And so, and it seems fairly accurate. There's a margin of error of several hundred years on either side, but you can tell certain things about uh, stone and like whether you take something off the top of the pyramid or deep down underground, you can roughly date how old it is. And that particular sarcophagus is roughly going back to maybe 2800 BC, give or take a few hundred years. And this one goes back, that one's newer, that at the very bottom, the bottom layer seems to be newer, maybe Middle Kingdom, I think I have a timeline here. If you look at this timeline, for example, this is, let's say, zero, that's around the birth of Christ, 500 BC, 1000 BC, 1500 BC, 2000, uh, Old Kingdom, that's where the pyramids go back to the Old Kingdom, at roughly around 2500 BC. Uh, to give you some idea of the antiquity of Egypt, you look here, for example, the pyramids in the era of Jesus, when Jesus walked the earth, the pyramids were already older than Jesus is to us now. You know, we're talking about vast antiquity. And it looks like that sarcophagus on the second layer, the, the, the gray one, is quite possibly as old, if not several hundred years older than the pyramids, which is significant for a number of reasons. And the, uh, the tomb of Osiris looks like it's more Middle Kingdom, which is around here. And, uh, but the other thing, this is the truly astonishing thing about this particular sarcophagus, it's made out of a rare stone called dacite, D-A-C-I-T-E. Uh, the sarcophagus at the bottom chamber, that's made out of, uh, I believe it's granite. But dacite is a rare stone. There's no other major monuments in all of Egypt that are made of dacite. And the closest vein of dacite 
to Cairo that is large enough to create a 25-ton sarcophagus is either in the Sinai or the Far Eastern Desert, which is hundreds of miles away. How did they transport back in the age of the pyramids a 25-ton piece of stone hundreds of miles over land and then bring it down that narrow shaft without damaging, if you remember the, the way that shaft looked, there's really no damage to the sides of it. It's an extraordinary feat logistically that they did this. So what is the significance of the tomb of Osiris? I have to start wrapping this up. I've got a ton more material, so I'll see what I can do here. Now, there are several things here. First of all, it, it was empty. Now, maybe it had been emptied out, but there's good reason to believe that it was empty, like the sarcophagus in the king's chamber. And this is basically what Temple suggests is the, the function may have been more symbolic than practical, a ceremonial site rather than an actual tomb. As Temple suggests, it may have served as a secret place of initiation and ritual reenactment of the death by drowning, burial, and resurrection of Osiris. Now, what did those ceremonies consist of? We don't know for sure, however, we can extrapolate certain things. There's a place in Egypt called the Osirian in Abydos, and there are inscriptions there that describe a similar sort of resurrection ceremony involving Osiris, you know, a ritualistic thing. So, based on kind of taking a hint from the work of Egyptologist Rosalie David, using inscriptions found at the Osirian in Abydos, Temple speculates this could have taken the form of the empty sarcophagus being opened and the priest, initiate, or pharaoh lying in the container, then having the lid placed over them as part of the ceremony. This may have even included the act of drowning in the sarcophagus, with the participant using an air tube or the remaining air supply to breathe. I wouldn't be surprised personally for various reasons if there wasn't an actual drowning, and then the person resuscitated for reasons I'll get to in a moment. And when the ceremony calling Osiris to rise up from the dead took place, complete with singing and praying, the lid could have been removed and the resurrected figure rise up to be born again. The ceremony may have also been attended to by a priestess representing Isis, presiding over the ritual resurrection. So the empty sarcophagus in level three can be seen as a symbolic statement in much the same way that the empty tomb of Jesus was seen by his followers as a statement about his resurrection and of life everlasting. Now, all of this seems so alien to us now from thousands of years in the future, these ceremonies raising from the dead, but I want you to just take a moment to look at this drawing of the resurrection of Jesus, and then look at this Easter pageant from a, uh, one of these wealthier churches. You see the continuity there. You know, it's really, it's, it may not be done with the same degree of solemnity or seriousness, but... You know, these ceremonies continue on in their own fashion, you know, and there's some reason to believe, in fact, that, you know, a lot of people do believe that, um, well, that some of the old beliefs and practices of, of ancient Egypt have carried on into Christianity, like you see the statues of Isis and the baby are similar to the mother and child in Christianity. This is his concluding statement about the tomb of Osiris temple. In conclusion, I should say that the Osiris shaft can never now be relegated to the status of a secondary feature of the Giza Plateau. On the assumption that it dates from the relatively recent period, 664 BC to 525, this is now seen to be definitely not the case. The bottom level of the shaft is probably Middle Kingdom, and level two is probably no later than the fourth dynasty, which is quite old. And what is more, the Dacite sarcophagus in level two being made of a unique stone that occurs nowhere else to our knowledge. Amongst the surviving remains of the ancient Egyptian civilization and being so unexpectedly ancient in date, must now be seen as one of the oldest and most precious of all carved objects to survive in the whole of Egypt. Also, the tomb of Osiris must now be viewed as being of extraordinary importance whether as a mystical burial site or more likely as a mystical religious site for initiations or ceremonies connected with the Osirian religion during the second millennium BC. Some of you may know about Robert Boval's hypothesis that the three pyramids are, you know, the off center there, the third one, basically to uh, represent these three stars of the belt of Orion. 
which it's highly contested even by many uh, people in the New Age community. I think it's pretty patently obvious that's what it is, you know, for various reasons. And it's the belt of Osiris, basically, in the sky. So the entire complex of the Egyptian Giza Plateau is an expression of this mythological system of which Osiris is certainly a major part. What are the implications of all this? Redating history, the possible evidence for uh, lost civilization. In other words, when you look at all this and you see this advanced knowledge that it took to create the monuments, to do the sculptures. For example, this is a, a sculpture that is in the Cairo Museum. This is from the very ancient period, the, the Old Kingdom. It's, it's a pharaoh, I believe it's Khafre. This is very hard stone. And look at the, the expertise of how this was carved and the symbolism of it. What John Anthony West said, which I think is, is true, when you look at Egypt, it looks more like a legacy than it does a development because a lot of the most advanced productions of ancient Egypt occurred near the beginning, like the hieroglyphic system, these extraordinary sculptures, uh, the pyramids themselves, they came early on. So it almost seems as though it was a legacy that they drew from an earlier source or maybe they were people that came and founded the civilization and then other people came in and more or less piggybacked on it. There's various theories about that. So, was there a lost civilization? Is Egypt a legacy like Casey and others have said over the years? Um, when you look at Mark Lehner's argument at the AAAS conference, his main argument was that there's no evidence for an advanced society that could have built these large monuments 10,000 years ago. And now some of you may know that there's a development in Turkey called Gobekli Tepe that uh, goes back 10,000, it's 10,000, it may be 12,000 years, I forget the exact dating on that, that's John West there next to it. And this is really causing historians to rewrite all the books because this monumental structures that you see here, these monumental structures, were built at a time that we were supposedly just hunter-gatherers. You know, there was no, supposedly no advanced society back then that could have built something like this. And they've only scratched the surface of this particular site. It's a mound that had been covered for thousands and thousands of years. So now there is evidence, in fact, contrary to what Mark Lehner said, that there was some uh, possibility for advanced stonework like this, amongst other things. And also, I think one of the legacies of ancient Egypt is, could there be now, today, an advanced society based on spiritual principles. I think the big challenge of that is, can you do that in a democracy? You know, it's easy to do in a theocracy, where you have a, <laughs> one way, one religion, and a leader, a pharaoh, you know, like a pope or uh, Dalai Lama, one person that calls the shots. But when you have a democracy, how do you how do you implement principles? I think it can be done. It's a, it's a complex subject and it's worth pondering, maybe even a lecture sometime about that. How do you create a society based upon spiritual principles in a democracy, in a multicultural, pluralistic society? Now, this is the really interesting question here. Do ancient Egyptian esoteric techniques survive to the present day? Now, I have fairly good reason to believe they do. My friend Barbara Keller, for example, has told me about, you know, she was friends with some high-level cops in Egypt, and I can't say too much, but there is reason to believe that some of the inner circle practices of the cops um, go way back before Christianity. And the funny thing is I happen to be looking through, it was either Isis Rising or Secret Doctrine at one point, and Blavatsky made a comment to that effect, talking about the cops and the mystical heritage of the cops. Um, now, for example, there is a Coptic teacher, now deceased, named Hamid Bey, who was a very interesting fellow. He wrote a book with a horrible title, 5,000 Burials. He came to America, he was going to work with Houdini, and he was going to be buried alive and put himself into a stasis condition where he could come back to life after a while. Then Houdini died, and he had to honor the contract, and he had to keep going around the country being buried alive. And he had massive, uh, tremendous control, self-mastery, control over his body. He could put his body into a state of suspended animation. 
but he also practiced very interesting techniques. The, his center is still thriving in Grand Rapids if you decide to go up there. Or you could look online, they still sell his writings, and it's, I, I highly recommend him. He was close friends with Yogananda. And there's a chapter, the opening page of my book actually, the first chapter, when I talked to my, this is my newest book, and this is um, when I asked Shelley Trimmer, the Kriya Yogi that I studied with, how he got involved with Yogananda, he said that he first went out to California to study with Hammond Bay. I didn't know that's who it was at the time, he said, an Egyptian teacher. And I went out there to see both him and, and Yogananda. I was actually more interested in the Egyptians since most of my studying had been in the direction of the Egyptian schools rather than the Hindu schools. But Hammond happened to be in Buffalo, so he, uh, Shelley went to Yogananda. When I spoke to Yogananda about the Egyptian, he said, I won't lie to you. That Egyptian teaches the same thing that I do, but he does not call it Kriya Yoga. And he claims it came from Egypt, yet he gets the same results. Now the techniques that Yogananda taught were basically Kundalini style techniques. I believe that in the, in the Coptic tradition they call it cobra breath. Whereas in the Kriya tradition they call it Kriya breathing, it's the Kriya breath. It's basically working with the spinal energies in various ways, bringing the energies up to the top of the head and circulating them in some practices. So. I really do think that the ancient Egyptians had a technique that was very similar to what was going on in India with these you know, higher meditative techniques, uh, especially with the spine. Not the spinal techniques are just some of them. But I do recommend that book, by the way, that's very interesting, The 5,000 Burials. And like I say, you can find out more information about his center in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's online. I think it's called the Coptic well, see, Coptic Center, Grand Rapids, you'll find it if you Google that. Now, that's a picture, by the way. Hammond Bay was quite close to Yogananda. That's Yogananda there, and that's Hammond Bay. They're officiating over an interracial marriage back in 1931, which was pretty scandalous. It was a way that they were trying to bring some degree of kind of racial harmony, you know, to do this ceremony where they married, uh, I believe it was a Hindu and an American woman. I do want to say this, uh, is there any reason to believe there's yet undiscovered tombs? Absolutely. And again, there may be still something underneath that, that sarcophagus in the chamber we were looking at. Um, I spoke to a fellow that, uh, named Jack, I won't give his last name, who spoke to Zahi Awas. And Zahi said he was going to, this is a number of years ago, he said that he was going to have to relocate everybody off of the Giza Plateau because there's a million plus people that live in the plateau around the Sphinx and the pyramids. And I said, how's that possible? It's going to take forever. There's, you know, so many people. And he said, it's going to take 10, 20 years to do it. And then a few, and I asked Jack, why do they need to do that? And Zahi told Jack that if you go along the outside of the Giza Plateau and you might get a kid coming up to you riding a bike saying, do you want your name carved in hieroglyphics in 24 karat gold? And the kid will come back, you know, 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later with the amulet or something with your name in hieroglyphics. And I said to Jack, why is that so important? And he said, 24 karat gold is not intrinsic to that part of Egypt, but it it's, was part of what you had in the tombs. And so apparently the people that lived in the area outside the Giza Plateau or on the Giza Plateau in the village, Giza Village, were supposedly digging down beneath their floors and finding these things and melting them down and selling them as trinkets. And so, and this is, you know, this is not well known, but uh, their fear was they wanted to get to these tombs and these uh, artifacts before everybody had plundered them for the sake of tourists and that sort of thing, or shipped them overseas as part of the uh, black market. And, uh, and it was about a year after Jack told me this that the New York Times had a front page story about they were relocating people off the Giza Plateau. And there's a lot of other things. There's, there's Andrew Collins has the caves underneath the, uh, the, the, the the other Giza, the Collins caves that they found underneath the Giza Plateau. and. There's a lot of other things. We don't have time to go into all that, but um, I really should wrap it up. It's, um, 
I'll leave this open for any questions you might have. I do have more I could say, but I, I'm running over here. Uh, one question and one comment. Um, the psychic that you had uh, with you uh, in, in the uh, uh -huh. uh, Osiris tomb, were uh, her contributions useful? There's no way to really know, but I went down with her and Boris, and uh, she was trying to pick up vibrations of what had happened, and she got the sense of, of I, I, she might have been picking up on the intermediate period when there was a lot of chaos, because she had the feeling that there was fighting and that there was warring factions, religious factions in Egypt, and that that somehow converged down in that room and that there was chaos. But she didn't pick up much more than that. Excuse me. So uh, not, not a whole lot, but she may have been accurate. It's just there's no way to know for sure with something like that. Yeah, and uh, the comment uh, is about uh, Mark Lehner. I go back to the time when uh, uh, he was still uh, a proponent of the ARE hypothesis. Yeah. And uh, actually, uh, he was speaking in downtown Chicago, giving a lecture, and uh, he mentioned that he had solicited uh, input from psychics about where to dig for the Hall of Records. And he showed slide after slide of uh, submissions. And so there would be elaborate drawings and diagrams. There would be uh, plans drawn out on napkins. But slide after slide showing different locations. And Very he just basically threw up his hands and said, you know, uh, how can I or any archaeologist work with this. Interesting. So, and that, that be, uh, began his skeptic slash agnostic phase. Right, interesting. Yeah, that's very, you know, there is one fellow, by the way, that is doing some very interesting GPS work on the plateau. His name is William Brown. And I don't know how much of it he's published, but he's been doing GPS work all over. And he's, he does seem to think that the tomb of Osiris does lead to something else. And uh, there are other areas, and in fact, Robert Temple believes that there are tombs underneath some of the temples, like the Sphinx in the Valley Temple on the Giza Plateau. You know, so there's much to be done, and I hope that some of that comes to light during our lifetime. Uh, there was a question over here. Um, I'm just thinking this was you know, 20 years ago, and said a few times that, oh, I shouldn't really say more. Do you, I'm just guessing that within this last 20 years that a lot of these things have to be known for sure and why don't why isn't there more definite you know facts about the things that everybody speculates on it's a good question i don't know but i do know there's more than we know and i mean there's more that they know that we don't know uh, my friend barbara keller was aware of work being done in the king's chamber that has never been really publicized you know where they're looking boris saeed went back he's now deceased but um he went into the king's chamber with sonic devices and he found very peculiar wavy patterns i believe it was under the floor which might account for some of the sonic properties that work has never been uh published to my knowledge and um and, but there's been work, Zahi did work inside the king's chamber, and I think he's probably done a lot of other things on the plateau that has just never been let out. And um, there's reasons for that, which I can't go into, it's a little touchy. But uh, I think they do know more than they're saying, you know, the Egyptologists and the officials in Egypt. Uh, about the initiatory aspect uh, uh, that uh, both uh, David and Temple brought up, but of course this even goes back to Blavatsky. So it's not that they're being credited with unique insights. Right. I, I guess what David and uh, Temple are doing, they're kind of refining the, the theories in a way that's very interesting. It does go back, there have been people saying these sorts of things in the esoteric community for quite a long time. Uh, but Temple and David are kind of doing the hard research to kind of validate some of those older ideas. Um, thanks for your uh, talk tonight. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I kind of, I struggle with, but I understand about the controversy about revising the history of civilization. Um, but uh, some of what you're talking about in terms of what's happening in Egypt, it just seems so corollary to what I learned about the um, ancient Greek um, 
mystery schools of, you know, going to a place and going down into the ground and being, you know, having this experience. Right. Um, and, and so in a way, and then, and that was something I learned about many years ago. And so I'm sort of confused if there's controversy about that, because hearing you talk about it tonight, you know, is a likely scenario of what was going on in Egypt. Um, it doesn't seem far-fetched at all in any way. It doesn't seem controversial at all because we've already got this sort of classical knowledge about later periods of people doing things along those lines, you know? And so it would make sense that people prior to that were doing things along those lines for some sort of spiritual uh, awakening. Well, it could well be that if they do find a hall of records or, I mean, I don't know if that exists or not. It could well be that other sites like Gobekli Tepe. Um, we may find out a lot more in the years to come about what people did and believed in the rituals of those old times. And there may be a threat of continuity. There's even theories about the, the uh, rituals that may have been performed in the caves of Lascaux, for example, in France, that are, what, 30,000 years old. And that those bison paintings on the wall may have ritualistic purposes maybe even astronomical meanings. So these, these sorts of rituals and practices and beliefs may go back way beyond, maybe even go back to the Neanderthal you know, periods. You know, it's, it's, we don't, I don't think we know a fraction of what there is to know about all this. Well, I just wondering if you'd comment a little more about Edgar Cayce's, uh, because he wrote a lot earlier than this even, uh, didn't he? I mean, in the 20s and 30s? Yeah. And Although he wasn't the first, I mean, he learned, he actually was, I think, quite inspired by Blavatsky and others. The notion of Atlantis and lost civilizations, that's a very old idea. And the idea that Egypt may be part of that legacy, that didn't begin with Casey. But Casey, I believe, was the first one to talk about a chamber beneath the paw of the Sphinx. Um, and he, and again, he had his own take on these things. So. You know, he made a major contribution in terms of the modern mythology around all this, but you know, I don't believe he was the first to kind of talk in these terms, nor was Blavatsky. I've had a lot of strange synchronicities around this, and I wanted to share this one with you because it was pretty unusual. I, gave, I haven't given a talk like this before, and it's funny that now we're under Jupiter opposed Uranus, and that first night of the Tomb of Osiris expedition happened under a Jupiter conjunct Uranus. You know, astrologers may understand the significance of that, but I gave a talk at Tim Boyd's place down on the south side of Chicago a number of years ago, and I brought some photos. I hadn't had them converted to digital slides yet, and I brought along my photos that I've been showing here tonight to the group and talked about a lot of what we said here. And I talked about some of the mysterious deaths around the Tut dig, which might be perfectly mundane. They may not be anything extraordinary, but they were worth mentioning. There was one in particular, my friend um, Barbara Keller was looking into. There was a fellow named Richard Bethel and his father, Lord Westbury. They both died mysterious deaths. Uh, Westbury uh, jumped out of a building and died. And Bethel was found suffocated to death in his bed. And I mentioned this at that talk at Tim Boyd's house. And I took the train back from the south side of Chicago out to Wheaton here after the talk, and I realized I had left my package with all my photos on the train, the metro train here. And I was kind of distraught about it because these were good prints of those photos. And I called up the lost and found at the train station, and they said, yeah, they had them. I could go down to the train station to find them. And the guy at the Lost and Found booth, he had looked at the photos and he said, you know, I, I have a family connection to Egypt. I had a relative that died a mysterious death in Egypt by the name of Richard Bethel. This guy at the, who manned the Lost and Found booth down at the train station, his last name was Bethel. And it was his relative that I had just been talking about to Tim Boyd's group. So, I mean, and I could go on all night with these strange synchronicities. So that's it. <laughs> I'm done, John. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, Ray.